welcome to the latest edition of Planted Unearthed. My name's Sam Peters and I'm one of the co-founders of Planted, the first contemporary design show and media forum aimed at reconnecting people and spaces with nature. In this second series of Planted Unearthed, we're continuing to explore how design, sustainability, architecture, food production and nature can combine to create cleaner, greener, healthier spaces. We're looking deeper into the issues surrounding access to nature and how to design and create spaces where caring for the environment, consuming responsibly and living sustainably all come naturally. Today we're talking to Jan Stannard, one of the founders of an amazing organisation called Heal Rewilding. Heal, who launched a crowdfunding appeal just over a year ago, are in the process of buying up land in the English lowlands in order to return it to nature forever. And I'm delighted to welcome Jan onto Planted on Earth today to tell us more. Jan, welcome to Planted on Earth. Thank you so much, Sam. Really pleased to be here. Well, it's great to have you on, Jan. I've been really looking forward to this episode of Planted on Earth. Um, I mean, why don't we start off just by telling us a little bit about your project? What are you guys up to and, and, and what are you doing? Heal is a project for everyone, really. It's our answer or an answer to um, dealing with the awful decline in nature and wildlife that we've seen in in the UK and to think that we are 189th worst in the world for nature you know Britain is never 189th for anything so we can do so much better than that Um, and rewilding is a way of making a real impact on nature recovery but it isn't just that it also fights climate change and it's a way of um, recreating um, spaces where all of us can go and just be quiet, find peace, support our mental health, support our physical health. So HEAL's three founding pillars are nature recovery through through rewilding, climate change action and well-being. And we came into being a year ago after several years of researching, thinking, talking, planning. Um, And it's been an amazing year and we're a registered charity Um, with a goal to set up a rewilding site in every county in England and there are 48 counties by my count Mm -hmm. so I may not see it but um, we had you know there are many charities that have got a lot of stuff done quickly and it's an emergency so we are going at it uh, with all our stops out so to speak. Fantastic I mean what a what a great project what a great concept I mean 189th for nature um, what exactly does that mean? That sounds quite a, sh- a shocking statistic uh, for a country that prides itself on being a, a nation of animal lovers. And uh, but what, what, can you can you sort of go into a little bit of detail on that, Jam? What does that mean? So, out of 200, 218, 218 countries that were ranked for nature um, richness or depletion, we come hundred hundred eighty nine. So that's species and abundance Mm -hmm. Um, and we are a nation that has been occupied by homo sapiens for an awful long time and uh, we are now a densely populated country um, and nature spaces in our landscape are now at one percent so humans are on the land on 99 percent of the land um and that's for whatever purposes but nature doesn't have much room left and that's part of the reason why it's so depleted so what we what we tend to have in the uk are areas which are pockets of um nature where wildlife can thrive but otherwise it's wildlife is um trying to hang on in our countryside which is tough Um, because there's really no food or very little food or shelter in in many places Um, and in fact where it's doing really a lot better although the the range of species is more limited is in urban areas Mm. so if you now go to so for example the soil in allotments is much richer than the average soil in the countryside because uh, yeah because of how that can armed for um for decades and we all need food. So this isn't about blaming farmers, but saying that we are in a system together, which mm. means that nature has has suffered in the countryside. And yeah, so urban wildlife and nature is is doing a lot better for those of us who have gardens or in our parks or even in our on our balconies. 
Well, we'd, we'd, I'd love to explore that a little bit more um, later on, uh, Jan, just this idea that people can help um, to enable nature in, in small spaces, wherever they may be. Um, but in terms of the sort of broader piece around rewilding, as I think in the last, it's fair to say in the last year to 18 months, the awareness of the of the idea, the concept has really started to, to capture people's imaginations. Isabella Tree's seminal book was certainly one of the first lockdown pieces that I I read and had a had a very um, profound effect in, on, on me and and I know many other people. Um, can you give a kind of idea, of just just paint the picture of what rewilding actually is and and why it's so important? Interestingly, it it, it emerged as a term in the nineteen nineties. A guy called Dave Foreman in the states, and we were rewilding is one of those terms that's now a contested term is the way I would I would call it. So in the US where it was first coined, it was the idea of huge scale wilderness, places where humans literally weren't present and, and about returning all species within a, um, an ecosystem to that, to that wilderness. So in America, it's involved top predators like wolves, bison, elk, you know, really huge species, um, raptor species and so on. And then as rewilding um, became, people in Europe became aware of rewilding, um, we were very different because of our, uh, the density of population in Europe and, the, and our le long um, years of, of occupation, um, it's, it's, it's become something a bit different. And it's been adopted and applied to all kinds of situations. Um, so in Europe, we are uh, generally looking uh, at uh, some top predators, but certainly in the UK, we don't we don't have wolves, bears, lynx anymore. It's possible that lynx might come back. Um, who knows about wolves? But it's a different kind of rewilding. So in in the sense of what it is, if I give you a lay description and a technical description. So the lay description is nature is in charge. So we don't run the land, we don't intervene. There is a piece of land and nature is in charge, but it isn't land abandonment. So it doesn't mean buying a piece of, buying a field and walking away from it. Because if you do that, the nature does nothing. It's, it's effectively in stasis. So the land is, it, there's no dynamism to the, to the land. Um, and the technical description is that it's the re rewilding is the restoration of natural processes resulting in a fully functioning ecosystem. And the most important thing for people to understand, which if they've read Isabella's Trees book, Wilding, um, is that that involves large animals that disturb the land because they are the, they are, they introduce dynamism and they result in habitats constantly changing. If you if you have a field you abandon, it, it might begin as grass, it will then turn to scrub and scrub means good things. It's good things like brambles and hawthorn and blackthorn, but eventually trees will take over and you end up, you may remember from school that you end up with, with essentially forest. And that's not as biodiverse as a, a landscape in which there are small herds of animals who move around and then you get open areas, you get scrubby areas and you get Woody area, wooded areas, and that is the greatest range of biodiversity. Um, and it's a complex topic, but that essentially is what rewilding is. Well, you, I mean, you described it superbly, Jan. There, if I may say so. But I mean, it is actually really important to understand that, isn't it? That this idea that it's not about just leaving vast acres of land to just basically go to, to, to not to ruin but to just but go wild essentially literally um abandoned um it needs management people need to be involved human beings need to be involved in this process and and also i think probably worth perhaps talking about the commercial benefits uh, indeed if there are some of of doing this this isn't about giving up on um on farming altogether by any stretch of the imagination is it no one of the outcomes of being 189th in the world is that um, um, is the recognition that all of us depend upon a healthy ecosystem, and so the government. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that Heal has done is fit in with the government's goals of um, creating half a million hectares of new space for nature. And one of the strategic pieces of work being done over many years is to put a value on those things that 
that aren't immediately saleable. So, and the way that's coming out is putting value on the carbon that um, uh, land sequesters when it's growing, um, not just trees, but plants and grass and soil, um, putting a value on clean water, which if you've got healthy soils, the water is filtered and comes out uh, in a much better condition, um, clean air, um, and biodiversity itself, so particularly pollinators, which are essential for farming. So these things are called, they're either called um, ecosystem services or they're called natural capital solutions. If you're thinking about sort of private sector term, the former is a government term, but all of these things are about putting value on the land. And so the, the way that land is, the way that the management of land is being paid for is changing that once upon a time, it was a, um, a system of, of being paid to produce food and that's changing. So farmers are being paid to, um, or land owners are going to be paid to look after land in various ways, um, support certain habitats. Um, so yes, it's it, it's definitely in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a time of big shift. I mean, it's actually really exciting to hear, Jan, isn't it? For people who have sort of instinctively um, felt that the land was being essentially kind of industrialized and, and, and huge swathes of our fields were hedgerows being ripped out and woodlands being cut back and all sorts of wild nooks and crannies being just essentially sort of uniformly chopped down. And for those of us who've instinctively felt that was a bad thing, but not really had a voice and also not really had any answer to the simple notion that, well, if you don't have it looking like that, you can't produce enough food um for those of us who felt instinctively like that it, this hearing you speak in this way and hearing that government and, and top people in the country decision makers have maybe a, a switch has been clicked um that, that's really exciting isn't it and it's not just that it's also climate change so um yeah so those two emergencies biodiversity and climate are have been um really influential and i think the the just to touch very briefly on the growing food question um there is also a shift happening um and it's i would say it's early but it's the movement away from the consumption of meat because um, it takes 39 plant calories to make one meat calorie. And so, um, and a lot of our land is used to grow food for animals that we then consume. So um, a lot of people will, won't change their diets, but some are, and that will gradually, there'll gradually also be a shift in the, in the way that the land is used for food production and, um, and for nature. Um, and, but we all need food. So it's really, uh, we, you know, we're relying, if the government believes that half a million hectares can be created for nature, and I think more than that is still possible, then um, then we, we trust in them to, you know, to, to have that right. And also urban areas are really important getting to mm. that spot too, because that, you know, there are, it, just where I live in our county, Berkshire, um, the gardens are a three, equivalent to a 300 acre farm, just in the town that I live in. Wow. So, you know, you can do a lot in gardens. Yeah. And that, and that's something we could talk about now. Indeed, that, you know, again, we all talk about whose responsibility is it? Is it should it be coming from the government to affect change in biodiversity and in, in carbon capture and, and changing the, the climate crisis? Or, 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 but essentially, individuals can also take responsibility, can't we? And, and, and just on whatever level and, you know, could for those people watching this who, who think I love the idea but I haven't got a lot of space I mean what what can people do who, who don't have huge great um, farms or, or, or estates to, 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 to rewild what can people do so let's start the smallest scale if you have a balcony which gets some sunshine plant plants even some grass because moths seek grass who knew moths seek grass um so plants that are that are pollinator friendly um so do some research and bear in mind that it's not just bees it's also moths are pollinators um uh, insects are pollinators so just have a look at that and make sure anything you grow um feeds um insects so that's the first thing if you have a garden you could think of think of this in two ways there's gardening for wildlife and then there's rewilding your garden and they're sort of similar but not exactly the same so you could think about provision for wildlife so if you've got space provision means food shelter place to breed place to hide so 
uh, um, leaving wood on the ground where insects can go underneath, um, a pond, vital, most important thing you can do if you haven't got if it's not if it's safe in terms of not having small children that can fall in a pond is the one of the best things you can do again lots online to look um leaving your grass area your lawn unmown in places unless you have a family and need to you know sort of kick a ball around long grass is great um and again filling your flower beds with um with pollinator type plants and what rewilding is is rewilding your garden is about being that big animals so disturbing the land a bit turning a bit of the soil over making some bare earth and you'll see bare earth is used quite differently it can be used by mining bees it can be used it's used in different ways so chop stuff off break things off sometimes you know imagine an animal browsing and chewing so mowing is chewing um, browsing is pruning you know you can see there are lots of similarities so and then if you don't have a garden or a balcony your local authority will love you if you volunteer to to and be part of your local wildlife group if there is one most places now have one because um things like hedgehog highways things like um helping toads across the road all sorts of things there's so much that can be done i mean my dad will be tearing his hair out watching this who uh he's been i think part of a generation that's grown up thinking that you know you've got to order everything in the garden you've got to have, you know the lawn is the only part of the garden that actually matters um and he makes it looks like look like Lord's cricket ground with his, his regular mowing. And um, but unfortunately, you know, well, no, in fact, it's good news to hear that people don't have to put in all that work to control everything all the time. It's we need to just we need to just let go a little bit, don't we? We do. And we have to. I love a stripy lawn because I, I've grown up with it. But <laughs> when I look out and realise it doesn't help any animals at all, mm. then, you know, any creatures and I care about wildlife, then you start to see it differently. So it's about a shift in how you see things. And 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 there are different kinds of beauty. So I think um, you can have some areas that that satisfy that part of you. But the moment you start to let your grass grow long and you go out and you see these micro moths, flitting around which are settling on the long grass then you see that you're helping mm. and and just observe there's so much going on in a tiny area of garden you can have huge number of species so it's it's really rewarding um particularly if you have any children because it's in, inherently fascinating to them and amazingly educational you can create a, a biology an open air wild biology laboratory in your garden so just what what a great way to, to educate children as well mm. um yeah. i mean it, going back to sort of bit bigger picture stuff, if we may, Jan, I mean, could we talk a little bit about carbon capture? Um, it's a really uh, complex subject or a difficult subject for lots of people to gra grasp. But why, why, why does rewilding help that whole issue around recapturing carbon and, and, and sequestering carbon? So I think the, the two, simply put, two ways that you can think about carbon capture on land are planting trees and rewilding the land. Planting trees ostensibly seems a good way to do it, um, but we don't know how to make trees take off as well as nature does because that's what it does and we tend to do it in the way that we think is right and clearly there's lots of science behind it and it is a, a way if they're properly chosen and planted and looked after essentially they will capture um, carbon, certain trees capture more types of carbon. So that is one way of doing it. But as I said earlier, it's less biodiverse. Um, the way that rewilding um, uh, works in terms of carbon capture is it's drawing down CO2 um, from the air in any of the green vegetation. So the more it grows, the more the vegetation grows, the more that's captured. Um, so in plants, in scrub and in, in grasses and trees, baby trees, which would grow up. Um, and, and also rewilding protects the land from another use that might be uh, more harmful. Um, so uh, chemicals contribute to, uh, carb uh, to um, climate change. So there won't be chemicals in use, for example. Um, and yes, yeah, so the land's not disturbed, which so when land is ploughed, a lot of people don't realise, even farmers don't realise that when you plough land, it puts carbon into the, back into the mm -hmm. atmosphere um, and also destroys soil structure. So, it, yeah, it, it, it heals the land, it holds the carbon, it captures more carbon and it protects the land. So rewilding and it's biodiverse. So it's a really rich solution to, to carbon, um, to climate change. But it's not 
the amount of carbon you would capture after 20 years wouldn't be as much as if you had a forest. So it's a it's a mixture. That's a, that's a fascinating concept as well. Just the act of ploughing um, releases carbon into the air. And um, and that there are, of, of course, a, I guess, maybe a, another addition of planted on earth. We could look at different ways of gardening um, and, and different ways of, of crop production, which doesn't actually um, impact the soil as much. But um, I mean, Jan, that's, it's, it's been fascinating talking to you. I mean, I'd, I'd love to talk to you for, for hours and hours on this, and I'm sure we will in the future. But I mean, Perhaps we could um, just wrap things up by, by just asking you um, how people can get involved with HEAL if, um, if they, they've listened to what you've said and, and, and loved what you've said, which, which I certainly have. Um, but but what, what can people do if they want to support this amazing project that you guys have started? So we set HEAL up to answer that very question. We wanted HEAL to be a way for anyone, even if they had a pound, to help nature recovery, climate change action and well-being. So there are lots of ways that you can help. You can um, give a one-off donation, you can donate regularly, you can become a friend of HEAL. So we don't yet have voting members because we're small, but we will, we have a Friends of HEAL scheme. That's all on our website. Um, but what people love is our HEAL 3x3 scheme, which is um, sort of illustrated on the wall behind us. So um, there is a wonderful location system, global location system called, apologies, what three words, and um, that enables a square of land, three metres by three metres, to have a, 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 its own unique address. So for £20, and then if we can get the gift aid for that, gift aid as well, um, um, people can have their names put on a square of land, and then when we acquire our first site, which will be in the south of England, somewhere between Somerset and Kent, then we will then um, tell people where exactly their three meter by three meter square is in our site. And then one day we hope they'll come along and gaze out over the field in which that square is. Well, what a, what a wonderful um, initiative. And, uh, you know, just we, you've got our absolute support of Planted Jan. Um, I'd like to also thank our friend, dear friend Paul de Swart at Another Country for, for introducing you to us. Um, I think it's a, it's a fabulous initiative and, and um, something that, that's got our wholehearted support here at Planted. So, you know, thanks for your time today, Jan. Um, I've learnt a lot, uh, not least that we're 189th in the table and uh, for, for nature. And quite frankly, that's not good enough for the UK. And we've got to get ourselves right, right, right back up to the top of that nature table because it's epically important. Um, I've also learned that moths eat grass um, and uh, that we can all help rewilding um, in whatever way we can, whatever space we have. So uh, what a fabulous concept, what a fabulous initiative. And uh, Jan, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Planted on Earth today. Really delighted to have been with you um, for this really interesting conversation, great questions, really enjoyed it and well done on the work that you're doing too. Well, thank you, Jan. I mean, uh, that just leaves it for me to say that if you've enjoyed today's series of uh, Planted on Earth, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, details of which can be found on our website, www.planted-cities.co.uk. On there, you'll find more great editorial content from some of the leading thinkers on design and sustainability, as well as exciting news about Planted's flagship event, event in London, which I'm delighted to say will be taking place at King's Cross from September the 23rd to the 26th. Watch out too for news of our excited Planted Members Club, which will be launching soon as offers on our exclusive plant, sorry, excuse me, as, and offers on our ex exclusive planted seed packs, beautifully designed and packaged by our friends at the Brilliant Land Studio. And I'll, uh, I'll show you the wonderful um, work that they've done. So that just leaves it for me to say thanks again to Jan from Hill Rewilding. Thanks to Horticus Living for styling our set. And thanks to you for watching. My name's Sam Peters and this has been Planted on Earth. <laughs>